All right, so we're ready to move on to the integration chapter, right? So at this point, um, we're all experts on derivatives, right? So we can, we can take the derivative of just about any function that you can think to write down, right? So we know, let's recap some of our rules, right? What do we know? We know things like the power rule, and of course, you know, sum, product, quotient rules, all those, all right? We know about derivatives of trig functions. Derivative of sine is cosine, and so on. I'm not going to write down all the trig derivatives, right? There's six of them. Um, we know that the derivative of the exponential function is itself. We know how to do the derivative of a logarithm. All right. And we know how to deal with combinations of all these functions because we have all the rules, product rule, chain rule, right? So if I, if I want to do sine of x cubed, we know how to do that with chain rule, right? Um, so if I want to do sine x times e to the x, we know how to do that with product rule. We, you know, any, anything you can think of writing down, we know how to take the derivative, right? If we can't use it with basic rules, Maybe we pull out implicit differentiation, logarithmic differentiation, right? We have, we have so many techniques, pretty much every function we've encountered in the course, we know how to take the derivative. Now we're going to look at things from the other side. Okay, so you can, you can take derivatives. Can you reverse this process? So if somebody gives you a function, right? So somebody says, okay, given some function f of x, Can you find, um, well, for some reason, we always call this capital F of X, capital F of X, such that when you take the derivative, you get back the function that you started with, right? That's what we're, that's what we're interested in doing here, is, is reversing the process, right? Somebody hands you a function, you say, what is this the derivative of can you can you back it up right and sometimes you can do this sometimes it's it's harder than you might think right um, so let's say somebody gives you something like well okay x to the n um, can we can we think where that came from well probably because we know the power rule, right? We know what the power rule says. The power rule says when you take the derivative of a power function, you do two things, right? Um, first, you multiply by the exponent, then you subtract one from that exponent, right? Okay, so suppose you wanted to reverse that process of multiply by the exponent, then subtract one from the exponent, right? So you're hitting the undo button, right? You've just done that, and now you say, oh no, I gotta back things up, right? I gotta undo, so you're hitting you're hitting Control-Z on the keyboard, trying to back things up. And so you say, okay, well, what, what's going to happen? Well, the first thing you'd have to undo is the last thing that you did. So the last thing we did was subtracting 1 from the exponent. So you say, okay, um, I need to undo a subtraction. How do you undo a subtraction? With an addition, right? So you say, okay, so I better, I better add 1, okay? What's the next thing I need to undo? Well, I did this multiplication, right? How do I undo a multiplication? With a division, right? So I need to divide. What do I need to divide by? This exponent that I have, the n plus 1, right? So I should do a 1 over n plus 1, right? So when you're reversing processes, right, you, you do the opposite things, in the opposite order, right? You reverse the order and each of the individual steps that came into the process, right? And then you get a result, okay? And, and we can make sure that this makes sense. How do we make sure? Well, um, the derivative of this function is supposed to give us back x to the n. Does that work? Well, yeah, because if I take the derivative, power rule says first thing I should do is multiply by the exponent. So I multiply by n plus 1, cancels with the n plus 1 that I have here. Then I subtract 1 from my exponent. So n plus 1, I subtract 1, gets me back to n. 
right? So I'm exactly where I expect to be. That works out. Good. Okay. Now, you might also ask yourself, is this the only possible answer? And, well, we know it's not because we know that when you're taking derivatives, any constant in your function, any constant that's being added, right, um, it's going to go to zero, right? Derivative of a constant is zero. Um, so in, in principle, I could put a uh, plus c, right? And that's going to work for any number c, right? Um, so when you're when you're looking for antiderivatives, right? We we talk about and, and let's um, we'll write this as a definition, but we're going to be very informal. Okay, so what we say here is that a function f such that f prime equals f is called an antiderivative of little f, right? And we're using the indefinite article here, an antiderivative, because we could always add a constant and get a new antiderivative, right? Um, now, one of the things that you might remember back when we were talking about the mean value theorem, we use the mean value theorem to show that if two functions have the same derivative, then their difference is a constant, right? So that means if you have two antiderivatives for some function, right? If I had a a capital F and let's say a capital G, right? And big F prime and big G prime were both equal to little f, right? There's two functions that have the same derivative, okay? Mean value theorem says their difference has to be a constant. Uh, so although in principle there could be many different antiderivatives, we know what they all are, right? We know that every antiderivative can be obtained by adding a constant to the one you've already found, right? So yes, in some sense, there's no unique answer here, but we can classify all the answers, right? Once you have one antiderivative, all the other ones are obtained by adding a constant to the one that you have, okay? Now, um, before we end this video, move on, look at some other aspects of, of antiderivatives. Um, note that there's one catch here. There's a value of n where this doesn't make sense. All right, if n is equal to minus one, I'd be dividing by zero. Ah. So we say, okay, wait, wait. So, so this is not, not perfect, right? We, the power rule doesn't quite work in reverse. Um, but if n is equal to minus one, we have what? x to the minus one, one over x. Oh, we know what the answer should be in that case, right? So the antiderivative of one over x is the natural log because the derivative of the natural log is, is one over x. So we do, in principle, know how to find the antiderivative of any power function, right? There's, there's one missing piece of the puzzle, but the natural log fills in the gap. So we're happy with that. Um, now, uh, I don't want to mislead anyone and make you think that, well, this is maybe some evidence that we will be able to find antiderivatives for every single function. Um, in one sense, yes, we can. Uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus is going to tell us that for any continuous function, we will be able to find an antiderivative. Um, but that antiderivative isn't necessarily something that you can express in terms of functions that you're familiar with. So there are going to be cases where, in principle, yes, there's an antiderivative, but it's not something that we know how to write down, um, at least not without using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, so as we proceed through the chapter on integration, you're, you're going to see some examples of that.